Praise be Jesus Christ in his most precious blood. This is Matthew Tibbetton from Reformed and Catholic, and this video will be on a discussion of George Herbert's The Country Parson and the Temple under the larger subcategory of um, what is the comprehensive pastor. Before we begin, I'm just going to offer up a short prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I ask that by your grace that you would illumine uh, the words to my mouth and the meditations of my heart. And Lord, we thank you for the example and the imitation of Christ led by George Herbert. We ask that we, through the contemplation of his work, would grow in love and knowledge of you. We ask for these things in the name of Christ our Lord, on the ages of ages. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So, um, the first thing to do is to give an introduction to who George Herbert is. Uh, George Herbert was a Welsh poet, orator, and priest of uh Anglican Church, who lived from 1593 until he died at the age of 39 in 1633. George Herbert is not only uh, a wonderful example of the types of saints that the Protestant tradition breeds, but uh, what George Herbert is mostly known for is he is arguably described as the best uh, Christian um, poet within the Anglican tradition. Now, um, to begin, some of the things that I would encourage people when it comes to picking up George Herbert's work is that one, it gives an insight into the early pastoral duty of uh, Reformed and Anglican preachers. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because uh, his work, his ministry was around the 1620s and the 1630s. This is shortly after uh, the stabilization of the uh, Reformed tradition. You would note that the period of Reformed orthodoxy that um, occurs after the, the, the beginning of the end of a Reformation in the 1590s. It is only about the beginning of the 17th century do we see uh, a more stabilized and consistent uh, form of the Reformed and Anglican tradition. Um, the second thing that I would encourage people when reading this book is that it provides um, a lot of valuable insight into the etiquette and lifestyle of a pastor. Um, in today's seminaries, you'll often hear from a lot of pastors that they don't teach seminarians, uh, you know, the etiquette. They don't teach them uh, all of the things that you actually do uh, apart from uh, preaching and doing counseling. They don't teach you how to do home visits. They don't teach you uh, how do you conduct yourself before civil authorities or uh, with your church wardens and etc. And I think that uh, this work uh, provides a taste of all of those things that they don't teach you anymore. But, um, okay. So. As I've titled this video, I called it The Comprehensive Pastor. And the reason why I describe it is because uh, what much of uh, George Herbert's work for Country Parson describes is all those things that occur outside of just counseling and preaching. One of the works that I'm reminded of uh, when reading uh, The Country Parson is uh, Dr. Peter Lighthart's uh, contribution to Mother Kirk, published by uh, Ken Press. Um, in his article, Dr. Lightheart, he describes, uh, he brings up this question and this uh, story, you know, who is there at the beginning of your child's birth? Who is there uh, when you are trying to buy a house? Who is there when um, your wife is looking for a divorce? Who is there when you're sick or your children are ill? Who is there uh, at the end of life. Now, when we look at those five things, we would think that, okay, the person at the beginning of our child's life would probably be the doctor or nurses. When we think of someone who uh, that we uh, are trying to figure out buying a house, or when we have purchased a house, we think of a real estate agent or a lawyer. We might also think of a lawyer when it comes to uh, the kind of legal proceedings that occur if your wife wants to try to have a divorce with you. We think about uh, a physician when we think about, or a pharmacist when it comes to uh, the uh, sickness of our own selves or a family member. And finally, we may think of the undertaker when it comes to the end of life. Now, while all five of those things are true, the pastor historically has also always been there. The pastor is there at the beginning of your uh, child's life, to be there with a the family when they've received a new life. The pastor is there 
when to bless the house and to um, you know share and be courteous with you when you've um, you know purchased a new property. The pastor is also there and should be consulted when uh, any kind of significant legal proceeding occurs, whether that be uh, an issue of property or of you know uh, hopefully not crime, but also and oftentimes unfortunately today within the church uh, divorce. A pastor should be there doing house visits uh, and should have some kind of knowledge when it comes to uh, the sickness that your child is going on, uh, is, has. And finally, the pastor should be there at the end of life. Uh, the pastor should be there uh, at the deathbed. You see all of these things within uh, the country parson. Now, of course, uh, you know, the pastor should. Uh, refer to both the lawyer and the physician when it is out of his reach. But it is interesting that uh, George Herbert describes that a pastor should be uh, should have the ability to cultivate his own herbs in his own garden, uh, and at times with those herbs and with that food, be able to attend to those who are sick. But with those herbs, you know, act as an apothecary, and at times as a physician, providing a diagnosis and medicinal remedies when it is within his own uh, knowledge and experience. Uh, similarly, the pastor should also know the basic juridical proceedings and answer uh, basic legal inquiries. Um, you know when he is approached by his congregation. Now, of course, you know when it is outside of his uh, domain or experience, he would refer to someone who is, has uh, greater professional experience than he. Uh, uh, the last thing that I would uh, note about this idea of a comprehensive pastor is that, interestingly, he also says that a pastor should know how to be good with arms and should also have the ability to teach others. Furthermore, onto this idea of a comprehensive pastor, we recognize that a pastor uh, should be broad in his knowledge, uh, not only being a, a jack of all trades in all areas of life, but his, um, his work, his profession, is outside of just his Sunday duties. A pastor throughout the week, uh, and in the case of George Herbert, he catechized the children from the Book of Common Prayer, uh, the 1549 edition, in the afternoon for not only children but also for older members. The pastor, he would always be carrying his pastoral hat, and what he means by that is that he is always offering uh, prayer and offering his services and counseling wherever he goes, wherever that's on the street, or when he's journeying and he's at a lodge, or wherever he's getting his groceries. A pastor at all times should see himself as a deputy of Christ. Furthermore, um, the pastor is should also exert his um, authority and uh, seek opportunities for counseling at all moments. That also includes, interestingly, when it comes to uh, just com conversing with nobility and the wealthy, both being courteous and recognizing uh, their own authority, but at the same time offering reproof when necessary when he understands and sees sin. The last thing that I'll note when it comes to this idea of a pastor's weekly duty is that really the country parson describes that the entirety of a pastor's life is a sermon. Uh, the life of a pastor not only gives uh, weight to the veracity of his words when he exposits the scripture, but it, above all, it gives his congregation um, an, an imitation and a um, an example to follow after. The way in which the pastor conducts his household is the way in which uh, his congregation should imitate also the way in which the pastor conducts himself at the table, whether he is uh, gluttonous or whether he overreaches more or whether he has consideration for those at the table, but also says something about the way in which his congregation should act. Um, the last thing that I'll kind of talk about when it comes to George Herbert's The Country Parson in the Temple is that, um, of course, since we understand that uh, this is kind of a biography, giving an insight into what the early Anglican and Reformed tradition looked like, uh, we could describe some of the things that were within the atmosphere or the ethos of this early Protestant tradition. Of those things, I find it interesting that in chapter um, 16, he describes that the parson should uh, see himself truly as a father-like figure. Furthermore, another uh, you know, somewhat Catholic thing that Protestants may be baffled by is how in chapter 22, he describes that he should be reminding his congregation to remember their baptism often.
you know, and he furthermore he describes that the baptism is the beginning into the Christian life. Um, I also find it interesting how in chapter nine he briefly describes uh, how it is necessary uh, for a pastor to consider his station of life, in particularly uh, whether he's married or not. Um, now, of course, he understands that um, in, in congruent with St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, that uh, marriage and a wife uh, and a husband, that they are remedies uh, towards uh, lust. He recognizes that above all, um, you know, the wife should be a uh, servant and should be someone that is um, helpful towards your ministry. He describes that, you know, a pastor should look for a wife not by his own ears, sorry, not by his own eyes, but with his own ears. And that's very similar to, as we see some of the language from the early reformers, including uh, Calvin and Luther, you know, um, Calvin once described that he would like to find someone uh, that is um, godly, a good cook, and could take after him, that would be able to aid him in his own ministry. The last thing that I'll describe about, um, you know, George Herbert's The Country Parson is um, really, it describes, you know, the spirituality that the Protestant tradition begets. Uh, as I said at the beginning of this video, uh, George Herbert, in a sense, he's kind of like an, a, a Protestant English saint. And I find those words to be strikingly true when you read um, some of his uh, comments about how the pastor should be conducting himself. For example, uh, and I'll look for the excerpt in chapter 27, um, in this section, he talks about uh, the mirth and the sorrow that uh, the pastor should be conducting himself with. So, uh, chapter 27, The Parson and Murph. The country parson is generally sad because he knows nothing but the cross of Christ, his mind being defixed on it with those nails wherewith his master was, or if, if he have any leisure to look off from thence, he meets continually with two most sad spectacles, sin and misery. Now, um, I find it interesting and uh, pretty similar to how many of the medieval monastics would describe, uh, or, and sometimes even the, the Greek Orthodox ascetics, how we should always conduct ourselves with, um, with repentance and with uh, sorrow, considering uh, the death of Christ at all times. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that we should always carry with ourselves um, you know, a, a perpetual severity. But as we see at the end of his chapter, he says, wherefore, he condescends to human frailties, both in himself and others, and intermingles some mirth in his discourses occasionally, according to the pulse of the hearer. So the reason why I describe that is because, uh, you know, just as uh, the Western monastics or the Eastern ascetics would describe that at all times, we should carry with ourselves, uh, you know, uh, sorrow, remorse, and repentance over not only our own sins and misery, but that above all, for the act of which which Christ loved us with. We should also at times condescend uh, and have uh, joy uh, and mirth and a great love and kindness when there are those around us to attend to. Um, furthermore, there are several instances throughout the uh, the country parson where he describes, you know, weekly fasting, fasting not only on Fridays until certain times, but also the abstinence from certain foods, whether that be meat or wine or eating uncooked food. So uh, if I were, uh, this right now concludes just some of my brief uh, thoughts and reflections on the country parson. Uh, but the last thing that I would describe is that, um, as we've described before, you know, you have a comprehensive pastor. Uh, the, the pastor, not only described within George Herbert's work, but also in Mother Kirk, that he should be good at many things. The pastor should be uh, should know medicine to some extent. The pastor should be able to answer your legal advice to some extent. The pastor should be good with arms. He should be able to help you. Um, visit, he should be visiting the sick. He should uh, know how to cultivate his own garden. Uh, but I think one of the things that uh, is not explicitly said, but is seen not only uh, in George Herbert's works, but also seen throughout uh, many of the examples that we see uh, within scripture, is that a good pastor, you know, and every good Christian, that for a, a good 
poet. Um, you know, once again, as we said, you know, the, the temple describes um, George Herbert's own personal reflections and devotional uh, writing. Um, I don't think I described this in the beginning, but George Herbert's works were actually not published by him. They were published uh, in 1652, about 20 years after his own death. Uh, but of that, his poems, including The Temple, which he is most famous for, they describe his own experience and uh, contemplations of his own experience as a pastor. You know that truly, uh, the church is a living organism, and in that church, or in the temple, as he's titled it, that there are all these intricate parts. You have uh, the doorway, you have the entrance, you have uh, the, uh, the church porch, and you have all the other uh, decorations of the church that really mean something, because altogether, you know, uh, the body of Christ in the church, uh, they're comprised of many parts. Um, and altogether, I think that uh, his contemplations of those will lead us to a greater understanding of uh, not only how the body politic of uh, Christ's bride functions, but above all, he does it through beauty. And that's one of the things that has always marked the Christian tradition. The Christian tradition is one about piety, but piety arises from beauty. And I think that's something that you'll hopefully encounter uh, through uh, the reading of the Temple and George Herbert's of his works. So these were just some brief thoughts. I know that they were pretty uh, scattered, but hopefully they may have meagerly convinced you to read his works. So uh, without further ado, God bless.